We praise Thee, O God, for the Son of Thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Hallelujah, Amen. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Revive us again. We praise Thee, O God, for Thy Spirit of light, who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Hallelujah, Amen. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory to the Lamb that was slain, who has borne all our sins and has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Hallelujah, Amen. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the God of all grace, who has bought us and sought us and guided our ways. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Hallelujah, Amen. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again. Fill each heart with Thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Hallelujah, Amen. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Revive us again. Good morning, church. Let's praise God this morning. You are beautiful beyond description, too marvelous for words, too wonderful for comprehension, like nothing ever seen or heard. Who can grasp your infinite wisdom? Who can fathom the depth of your love? You are beautiful beyond description, majesty enthroned above. And I stand, I stand in awe of you. I stand, I stand in awe of you, holy God, to whom all praise is due, I stand in awe of you. And I stand, I stand in awe of you, and I stand, I stand in all of you, holy God, to whom all praise is due, I stand in all of you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you now and are truly in awe of you. Father, as we prepare to worship together, I pray that each one of us will be able to be encouraged, be uplifted, to uplift those that are around us, Father, in preparation for going out into the dark world. 
Father, I pray that you will help us to be the lights in our communities. Help us to show this world that you truly are in control and that you love all of us. Father, be with us now as we continue in our worship. Thank you so much for blessing us beyond what we can even remotely imagine. Father, I pray that you'll be with those who uh, are unable to be with us today for whatever reason, whether it's sickness or uh, whatever it is, Father, I pray that we will know those needs and be able to uh, be of assistance or encouragement to those. Thank you so much for your son, Jesus, who makes this all possible. It's in his name we pray. Amen. All hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him, Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him, Lord of all. Let every kindred Every tribe on this terrestrial ball to him all majesty ascribe and crown him Lord of all. To him all majesty ascribe and crown him. Lord of all, oh, that with yonder sacred throng we at his feet may fall, we'll join the everlasting song and praise him, Lord of all. We'll join the everlasting song and praise him, Lord of all. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> On bended knee I come, with a humble heart I come. Bowing down before your holy throne, lifting holy hands to you as I pledge my love anew. I worship you in spirit. I worship you in truth. Make my life a holy praise to, to you. On bended knee I come. With a broken heart I come. Bowing down before your holy throne. As I look upon your face, showing mercy and your grace, change my life, O Holy Spirit, and my life forever new. Make my life a holy sacrifice to you. Make my life a holy sacrifice to you. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain. <clears throat> 
I count but a loss and poor contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my Lord. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to His blood. See from his head is And our, and our thoughts as we um, get ready to partake of, of the Lord's Supper. Um, I just want to read um, from Matthew chapter 26. Um, I'll start in verse 20 and, and read through that, um, that passage that describes the Lord's Supper as it's accounted in Matthew. And, and one thing I, I want us to focus on as we read this is I want us to focus on maybe just the emotions that are happening in this room. And, and if, if, if you were one of, of those in that room, you know, what kind of emotions or feelings um, would you be having um, as, as this is taking place? So starting in verse 20, when evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the 12. And while they were eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him, one after the other, surely not I, Lord. And Jesus replied, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The son of man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. Jesus answered, Yes, it is you. While they were eating, Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. 
This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now, from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So reading through that, there's several different emotions that, that maybe came to my mind. Uh, you know, if I was one of the 12 in there, or if I'm, if I'm trying to, just as I read this, kind of trying to understand and, and put myself in the scene, you know, I had some, maybe I would have felt very angry. Maybe sadness is an emotion that would have overcome me. I think confusion could have been an emotion. Uh, for some in that room, it might have been shame. Maybe guilt. And who knows, maybe for some they were just hungry. Uh, but I do think a lot of emotions going on in that room. This morning, as, as we gather around uh, the table and partake of a similar feast to remember the sacrifice that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ made for us, what kinds of emotions are we bringing this morning as we partake of this? I know there's been many a morning where it was emotionless. And I say that as a, as a confession to my brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, you know, it was just another thing we did, just another act of worship, um, just trying to get through the morning. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know what kind of emotion you're bringing this morning. I don't know if it's one of, of anger, confusion, maybe it's shame and guilt uh, that you're bringing this morning. I know that's one that I, I, I bring more times than not. Um, maybe this morning you haven't put a whole lot of thought into what we're about to do. Um, I know the Lord had quite a, a list for the disciples to prepare for the Last Supper. And, and, and I hope this morning that there is some sort of emotion that is washing over you um, as we partake uh, of the bread and of the fruit of the vine. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we love you and we thank you for allowing us to experience this day. Uh, to wake up even when it, it might not have been easy, but to, to arrive here at your house, to sing songs of worship to you, to read from your word and, and to speak to you and to know that you are listening and to know that you are with us. Father, this morning we, we gather together as, as a group ready to focus on the sacrifice that you made for us as we partake of the bread that represents the body that was broken on the cross for us. Father, may we remember Father, may we never forget and may that sacrifice be what drives us throughout the week. Father, as we, as we partake of this bread, please bless us. And may we never forget. And it's through your Son that we pray. Amen.
As we continue reading in, in the book of Matthew, uh, I want to pick up again in chapter 28, uh, continuing on this theme of emotions. Uh, the emotions of some of those first eyewitnesses of the resurrection. After the Sabbath at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, he has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Lots of emotion in that passage. Um, we could continue reading about the guards' report and the emotions that, that they must be feeling, which is a completely different set of emotions um, than what the two Marys had just gone through. But we are about to partake of, of the fruit of the vine uh, that represents the blood that was shed for us. Um, without the blood... Um, there is no forgiveness. Um, and I, and I, I think about the sorrow and the pain, but I also think about the victory over death and the celebration, the rejoicing of that conquering death uh, that Jesus was able to overcome. And, and to have that, that emotion while we're partaking of this fruit of the vine as we're celebrating victory over death. Let's pray. Father God, once again, we come before your throne in remembrance, remembrance of the blood that was shed, the inhumane acts that Jesus went through for us. And Father, we are saddened, we are sorry, we, we, we don't even understand why it had to happen that way. But Father, we are so grateful and we are rejoicing over the victory over death. And Father, while we're here on this earth, may we continue to spread that good news. And Father, we look forward to the time where you will call us, where you will call us home to, to also experience that victory over death. And we know that only comes through Christ. Father, right now, please bless us as we partake and remember this juice that, that represents the bloodshed. May we never forget. And it's through Jesus we pray. Amen.
It is at this time that we are going to pass the plates and we are going to collect an offering. This is for uh, the members here of the, of the Highway Church as we give back to our congregation to, to help continue the, the works here in, in Jetsonia, um, around the state and around the world. Let's, let's ask God's blessing upon the offering. Father God, we can't say it enough, and we pray that we're just saying this all the time. We love you. Father, right now we gather together as a group of believers, and, and we just want to give back some of that of which you've given to us. Father, we pray that this, this monetary offering this morning will be useful to further your kingdom and to help those in need. And Father, we pray that this is just a springboard for our offering of, of our time and energy and other resources throughout the week. May this kickstart us and um, may we have the eyes of Christ to view others and, and to view situations and to find areas where we can help and, and give to those throughout the week. We ask, your, we ask that uh, you bless those who are in charge of these funds here, here at Highway. May we be good stewards of what we have. And, and, and may we use it to uh, just further your kingdom, Father. We love you. Thank you for listening to us. And it's in Jesus we pray. Amen. Father, we love you, we worship and adore you, glorify thy name in all the earth, glorify thy name, Glorify thy name, glorify thy name in all the earth. Jesus, we love you, we worship and adore you. Glorify thy name in all the earth. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name in all the earth. Spirit, we love you, we worship and adore you. Glorify thy name 
in all the earth. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name in all the earth. Let's stand together. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name in all the earth. This time we want to miss our children to the nursery as well as our children to Wiggler's worship. <clears throat> Let's sing this song together before Devin comes up. Holy words long preserved for our walk in this world. They resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart words of life, words of hope. Give us strength, help us go in this world where we roam. Ancient words will guide us home. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts. Oh, let the ancient words impart holy words of our faith handed down to this age came to us through sacrifice oh heed the faithful words of christ holy words long preserved for our walk through this world they resound with god's own heart oh let the ancient words impart ancient words ever true changing me and changing you we have come with open hearts oh let the ancient words in sing it church ancient words ever true changing me and changing you we have come with open hearts oh let the ancient words impart we have come with open hearts oh let the ancient words Simbon. Please be seated. From First Timothy, Chapter Three. Deacons likewise must be dignified, not double tongued not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. And let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, 
faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. At the end of our service today, we have the privilege of appointing seven additional men to serve as deacons in this congregation. Back in October, we appointed two additional overseers or elders, and at that time I took the opportunity to remind us of who those people were and of what was expected of them. And I'd like to do that again this morning with these deacons. Who are the deacons? And just what do they do in the church? So I want to start here. The English word deacon comes from the Greek word. Now I want you to remember this. Deacon. And it literally means servant or minister. Now, this family of words is found all over the New Testament, like over a hundred times in the pages of the New Testament. But here's where it gets a little bit tricky, because there are three places where the word seems to take on a special significance. Now, two of those are in this text where Paul refers to deacons. The other one is in Philippians chapter 1. Look at this one at the very beginning of his letter. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. Now that's a different word right there. To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons. So the way Paul uses that word here and in 1 Timothy makes us think that there are a couple of recognized roles within the early church. We believe that although we are all called to be saints, although we are all called to ministry in this kingdom of priests, that there are some among us who, because of their particular giftedness, are set apart by the congregation for particular areas of service. I want you to listen to how Paul describes the inner workings of the church in Romans 12. Listen to this. He says, For the, by the grace given to me, I say to every one among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Here's the thing. We are all called by God the Father to salvation in Jesus the Son for works inspired by and empowered by the Spirit. That's true of all of us. But there are some who, because of their particular giftedness, are acknowledged by the church or appointed by the church. And that's, I think, a big deal. The folks who we recognize as leaders among us are not those on a power trip. They're not those trying to uh, hold up some... Uh, hierarchical structure. They are those whose lives and service to the church are already in evidence. And the church also, through the gift of the Spirit, recognizes those people. 
and appoints them or places themselves under their leadership. Uh, listen to how Paul explains it to the Ephesians. He says, But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. And then he says, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature personhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way to Him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. I, I want you to understand that when we recognize leaders, it's not because of some hierarchical model that goes um, from the top down. I, I think that's the way we've done it in churches a lot. We've said, all right, We'll give lip service to Christ as the head, and then the elders are just a step down from under that, and then you've got the preachers and the deacons and the regular members. That is not in the Scripture anywhere. What is in Scripture is that Christ is the head, and every member functions under His headship according to the gifts that he or she has been given. Elders have a particular gift set and a particular obligation. Deacons have a particular gift set and a particular obligation. Ministers, and so on and so forth. And this is really significant. In this passage in Ephesians, Paul focuses more on the gifts related to preaching and teaching, what, what we might think of as pastoral gifts. But those aren't the only gifts active in the local church. Paul seems to have pastoral in mind. Peter adds something else. Look at this text in 1 Peter 4. Also about spiritual gifts. He says, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Varied grace means varied gifts. And Peter defines what those are very broadly. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Do, do you see it on the screen? Paul, uh, Paul uh, refers us to some pastoral gifts, preaching and teaching and shepherding. Peter says there are two kinds of gifts. He says there are gifts of speaking and gifts of service. Some have gifts of speaking, some have gifts of service. Well, which one of those words do you think best describes the work of a deacon? The work of speaking or the one of service? Well, the word means servant. So, we believe that the ministry of the deacon is a ministry of service. Now, a lot of folks think you can trace this ministry back to the very first days of the church. I want you to look at this text in Acts chapter 6. The story goes that in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists, uh, those were ones who had, uh, uh, Jewish folks who had um, become a little bit more comfortable with the prevailing culture. They probably spoke Greek and so forth. A complaint arose by the Hellenists against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. I take it that in the days of the early church, those such as widows who couldn't necessarily care well for themselves were cared for by the church with either gifts of money or food or other sort of helps. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, Brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, 
whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. Well, they said, please, the whole gathering. And they chose the seven who are listed there. And then verse 6 says, they set these before the apostles and they prayed and they laid their hands on them. You can see it in this text, can't you? A distinction that is made between the ministry of the Word and the ministry of serving tables, between those who speak and those who serve. Now here's the deal. The word deacon is not mentioned in this text. The twelve don't say appoint deacons. But, but here's, here's the interesting thing. Uh, Matt, go back to that, that previous slide. You see that little phrase there, to serve tables? In Greek, the word is diakonane. Do you hear it? Diakonane, deacon. These men are not called deacons, but wow, the ministry that they, that they offer sure does sound like the ministry of the deacon. So for all of these reasons that I've mentioned, we believe that the ministry of the deacon is primarily a ministry of works of service. Elders and or pastors are devoted to the ministries of the word and prayer. Deacons are devoted to ministries of service. Here's how it ought to look. When the elders meet in their elders meetings with the pastors and the other preachers and so forth, they ought to be praying over the flock, discussing things that uh, affect the flock. And when the deacons get together in their meetings, they ought to be paying the bills and paving the parking lots. Okay? Now, I know that may sound weird to you, uh, unless you're like me and you've grown up in churches where the elders do the deacon's work, the preachers do the elder's work, and, and the deacons don't uh, <laughs> really do anything. Right? I am so proud of our congregation that our elders have taken the lead to say, we shepherd the flock, and they have worked really hard to empower the deacons to do works of service. You ought to be thankful that you have elders that view things that way. Now, it's, it's still hard, isn't it, to release some of those things because deacons can be timid and elders can be not timid. Uh, but we've worked really hard here to do that. We believe that our elders and our pastors are devoted to the ministries of word and prayer and that our deacons are devoted to the ministries of service. Now, just like the elders... Deacons must demonstrate certain qualities of character. Here in Acts, the apostles say they should be of good reputation. They should be full of the Holy Spirit. They should be full of wisdom. Paul, again in 1 Timothy, gives a list of what we call qualifications. I prefer to call them qualities of character. Listen to this. Deacons, likewise. Likewise means that in the first uh, seven verses, he talks about elders or overseers. Now he turns his attention to the deacons. Likewise also means that a lot of the same things that apply to elders will apply to deacons. Deacons, likewise, must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience, and let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, <clears throat> managing their children and their own households well. But those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Let's just take a look at this list very quickly. Deacons must be dignified. This is that from Acts 6 which stresses a good reputation. These people, you need to have a good reputation both in your church and in your community. I've told you before about working with churches where I'll meet people out in the community and I'll say, well, such and such is a deacon in our church. And they'll say, really? <laughs> you know, they're as surprised by that as maybe I should be. Well, that's not what you want to hear when you say so and so is a deacon or an elder at my church. You want to hear people say, that makes sense. That is a good person. They have to be dignified. 
They must not be double-tongued. Your translation may have sincere. Literally, the text says, me dialogus, not double-worded. Um, not exactly sure what's at stake there, although it seems to me these have to be people of their word. They don't say one thing and do another. They don't treat the Hellenists differently than they treat the Hebrews. They're not double-worded. They're of one word and one mind. He must not indulge in much wine. Don't ask me what much wine means. Tim and I were talking about that before the service starts. Elders, don't be drunkards. Deacons, stop just in time. No, I don't know if that's what that means or not. Uh, I think the message is uh, these people ought to control their appetites, just like all of us should, so that we do be people of good reputation in our congregations and in our communities. Uh, must not pursue dishonest gain. There is good indication in these letters to Timothy that there were some who were grabbing for leadership in the church because I don't know if it was a paying gig. I get the impression that there were elders or pastors who were paid for devoting their lives to this work. And so it really looks like in First and Second Timothy there were those who were grabbing at positions of leadership in the church because they thought it was a means to gain. And if the only reason you're in this game is because you think it's a means to gain, you'll end up doing whatever you need to do to get more gain, right? And so these folks should not desire this ministry because it means that they're going to somehow pad their coffers. They don't need to be people who are easily tempted to defraud or steal or otherwise take advantage, especially if they are in the ministry of money management in the congregation. Paul says they must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. These are not folks that are necessarily tasked with the preaching and teaching ministries of the church. Elders and pastors are particularly tasked with that, but nevertheless, these folks ought to know the story of the gospel, the mystery of the faith. They ought to stand in, 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 in holding that uh, strongly, this truth of the gospel, and more than holding on to it, living it out so that their lives, again, can be dignified. Now this is interesting. The text says they must first be tested and that if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. This is one of the few passages in Scripture that explain how this process works, but it doesn't really explain anything. What does it mean they are to be tested? Well, I can tell you the way we've interpreted it at Highway. At Highway, uh, we've had these seven men before you for the last two weeks. We have encouraged you to take a look at their lives, and if you find something that doesn't pass this test, we've said, tell us, and we will consider it. As far as I know, nothing like that has happened. I should have asked that question before I got up here, shouldn't I? But as far as I know, that hasn't happened. So it could be tested in terms of these qualities of character. It could also mean tested in terms of their, their service and their ability to do the things that we have asked them to do. I know that in a lot of churches, when it comes time to appoint deacons, we look for good old boys that we don't want to lose. And so we think maybe if we give them a job to do, they'll step up to the plate. That's not the way this, uh, that's not the way this works. This is not an election. It's not a popularity contest. It's not something where get the guys with the big bucks to step up so we don't lose their big... No. Typically, the way this works is that we find those people who are already exercising their gifts, their reputation is, is above board, they are already serving as servants to this congregation, and now we appoint them or recognize them. We've tested them. Paul says a deacon must be the husband of one wife and manage his children and household well, the same that's expected of an overseer. The idea here is that this person's reputation with his or her uh, spouse, children, the opposite sex, is above board. There's no question about their integrity with the opposite sex or their faithfulness in their marriages. Now there's one verse that I kind of skipped over in telling you what all of these qualifications are, and that's verse 11. Um, <clears throat> verse 11 says there, Wives likewise must be dignified, 
not slanderers, but sober-minded and faithful in all things. This is a very difficult text, and let me see if I can illustrate it. I hope this works. Does anybody have a translation of verse 11 that has a word other than wives? Anybody in this, in this group have a translation that has a word other than wives? I think ESV has wives, NIV has wives, King James has wives. Anybody have a New American Standard or an Old American Standard? Joe, do you know what Old American Standard and New American Standard translate this as? Well, there's no such word as deaconesses. Okay. Uh, no, no, I, I'm not. I, I didn't. I did. I wasn't saying that about what you just said. Um, there's no fe feminine of this word deacon. And there's no feminine of it. And it's going to come back to play in, in just a minute. It's it's the word for woman right there, uh, where the ESV translates this word as their wives, likewise. Um, the word is gune, and it's translated as wives or women, depending on the context. And you say, well, dummy, can't you read the context? This is, this is meant. Well, the only problem is, if you've got a New American Standard, which, is, which, by the way, is considered a pretty conservative translation, if you're reading the New American Standard, the text says, let women be. And so there is a, there is a real interpretive issue in this text. Is Paul describing women who would serve as deacons, or is he describing the wives of deacons? Now, you might think this is a no-brainer uh, because of the way we in the churches of Christ view the jobs of elders and deacons. We view those as very authoritative positions of, of leadership. Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that if you're talking about servants, there is no authority that is attached to that. As far as authority, it's, it's, a, it's a servant. It's, it's behind the scenes. It's, um, uh, it, it's scrubbing toilets and things like that. So I, I'm, I'm not sure that we do a service to ourselves here if we view these deacons as the authoritative leaders over us. Another problem is, and this is what Joe was alluding to with this deaconess, why did the translators decide in these three places to translate this word as an authoritative role, a deacon, must, when everywhere else in the New Testament is translated as minister or servant? And, and the reason that's significant is because in, in, um, in 1 Corinthians, Paul addresses, or is it Romans? Paul addresses, it's in chapter 16, whatever it is. Paul addresses Phoebe, who is a, and the word is diakonon of the church in Sincrea. Now, why isn't that translated as deacon? In, in your translation, it's translated as a servant of. So, there are some significant questions here. Uh, another question is, why would you have... Why would you have qualifications for deacons' wives, but not elders' wives? Do you notice that? There's no qualification for elders' wife in this text, but there is for deacons' wife. Now, it could be because deacons may be in a position when they are working with people of the opposite sex, and so it's more of a partnership-type ministry. It may well be that that's the case. But I know that there are some congregations who have females in this role of servant. Apparently, some of the early churches did. However you interpret this, the qualification, the quality of character is the same. Do you see it? Dignified, not slanderers, sober-minded, faithful in all things. However you translate it, the qualities of character are still the same. What there's no question about is the reward that these faithful servants accrue. Those who serve well in this capacity gain a good standing. Their reputation becomes even greater and a greater confidence in the faith. I think a lot of times we have practiced appointing deacons as kind of a training for the eldership. 
We have viewed these as in the minor leagues of church leadership waiting to be called up to the big show. And maybe that, maybe that happens sometimes. Maybe there are some uh, folks who are put into these positions who then continue uh, to grow in that capacity and move toward more service. But certainly this is not just menial labor. This is a position that the church recognizes because you are serving the church and your reputation is good in the church and your influence is influential. This is spiritual service. And Jesus reminds us that those who would be the greatest are those who are the servants of all. And so with that in mind this morning, I'd like to ask these seven men to join me on the stage as well as the elders, if you would come on up at this time. Gentlemen, bring your wives and families with you too, please, if they're here. Because apparently your wives are mentioned in the text. Mike, are you going to lead this? One of the traditions that's been going on for quite a few years is uh, to give these men a charge. It's uh, written out in letter form and in a frame that you see there. And uh, I'd like to read that charge. Um, the seven men, in case you don't know some of them, Tony Benton over there, Kenny Simpson, uh, Whit Jordan, where's Ricky? Oh, sorry, Ricky Cologne. <laughs> I missed you somehow. Uh, Brad Smith, Robert Evans, and Don Davis. Did I miss anybody else? Okay. Uh, they each have a letter that reads as follows. We, the members of the Highway Church of Christ in Judsonia, Arkansas, charge you to serve as a deacon. We charge you to live before us as examples of righteousness. We charge you to trust in God's strength to lead you, live by faith. We charge you to accept the grace and mercy of God, and we pledge to extend to you the same. We charge you to serve as a deacon to the best of your ability and to the glory of God, and to serve in the area that the elders see a need and ask for your assistance. God bless you as a man of God and in your work as a deacon. Thank you. And Bob, would you pray for us? You care to do that? Hey guys. Y'all line up right here. And if if the rest of our deacons would come join us up here, please. In uh, in alphabetical order. Let me get you Brad, come here. Don, <laughs> First right name here. or last name? Last name, first name, Dad. Kenny, where's Kenny? Uh, Kenny right here. <laughs> Rick, hey, I got to get it the way I got it in my head, guys. Robert, <laughs> Tony, who's next? Whit. Whit, there you go. Have I got it right now? Okay. She asked if I um, remembered it. Let's pray. Father, we're just so thankful for these men. Father, we thank you for their involvement here at Highway. We pray, Father, for their, their families. We just thank you for their families that they uh, are so involved here. We pray, Father, that you give these guys strength, 
just be with them and help them, give them the courage that it takes to uh, work here with Highway. Father, we pray for Brad and for Don and for Kenny and Rick and for Robert and for Tony and for Whit and just, just help them. Help them to be the leaders here that they need to be. Father, help us here at Highway to be the leaders that we need to be here in this community. <laughs> Father, you know the struggles that we go through here all the time. These guys know the struggles that we go through and they said that they're willing to help us to fight the battle here in this community. Father, we love them and we know that they love you. Just be with us, for in Christ's name, amen. These guys, uh, they've all agreed to take works. We've got something for all of them to do. And, and I looked out here amongst you. There's not a whole lot of visitors here, so uh, most of you know me, and most of you know I'll say anything about any time. But now then, we've got uh, 19 deacons and we've got 17 thrones so uh the elders don't have to take care of thrones anymore guys <laughs> we finally made it <laughs> you might want to tell them what you're talking about thunder mugs they try it again surely they don't know what they know what a throne is well i'm hoping i'm hoping bathrooms <laughs> These folks are called to live up to a high uh, standard. But is that standard any different than what the rest of us are called to live up to? Is there anybody in this auditorium that is free from the call to be of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom? Is there any one of us free from the call of, of, of living dignified lives, not, not double talking, not going around drunk, uh, managing our households. Is, is there any of us free from that? Of course not. We're all called into this high calling because it's more than just what we preach that convinces people. It's how we live that makes the doctrine attractive. And so that's how we offer an invitation this morning. If your life is such that you have not come into conformity to Christ, if your reputation is not good, if you're a mess, it's not just you that sees that, the world sees that. And in some cases, it brings shame and disgrace on the church and on its Lord, and, and we can't have that. And so we ask this morning, if your life is out of step with these qualities of character, you need to repent. And maybe that repentance looks like a public thing where you come up and you ask for intercession and, and strength. Maybe it's a decision you make in, in the pew where you're sitting right now that you are going to live such a life that uh, even though people would want to say bad things about you, they see your good deeds and those good deeds may just be what it takes to point people to the Lord Jesus so that when He returns, they will give Him the glory too. So that's our lesson this morning. Pray for these people that we have appointed and if you are not right with the Lord it's time to get right while we stand and sing all to Jesus I surrender all to him I freely give I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live I surrender all I surrender all all to thee my blessed Savior I surrender all, all to Jesus. I surrender humbly at His feet. 
thy bow, worldly pleasures all forsaken. Savior, ah. 